You must obey God rather than man. This is one of the phrases in Scripture that, get, that gets used quite a bit. That's not to say that it's untrue or that it lessens when you say it more often or anything like that, but it is one of the ones that we hear quite often. You must obey God rather than men. This sounds like a commandment, mainly because it is a commandment. Obey God. Do not obey man. I think, I know, we put too much trust in, in men, in politicians, in uh, uh, psychiatrists, uh, in to everything. Even in your own accords, your own self, you crawl inside. And we obey not only men on the outside, but we obey the men who we are on the inside. We obey our sinful nature. We obey temptation. But this is not all law either. Because the one who was to complete the obedience was Christ. When it says you must be obedient to God and not to man, that's what Christ did. Even in the Garden of Gethsemane, he says, let this cup pass from me. For he did not desire to drink it. He did not desire to be crucified. But it had to be. Because Christ had to obey God rather than me. And I can prove it to you. What happened when Christ stood before, C before uh, Caesar and before the high priest? Uh, Pontius Pilate, I'm sorry. Pontius Pilate and the high priest. The high priest, or the, the, the uh, Pontius Pilate was confused because he says to Jesus, you, these, these charges are very serious. Why would you have to say for yourself? And he says nothing. He's asked over and over questions, but he says nothing. He does not obey men, but rather God. Until finally, they, he, they ask him, tell us by the living God if you are the Christ. And Jesus says, you have said so. Or, in the original Greek, it says, you said it. In other words, you said it, not me. You made the confession. That's all Christ had to say. That's all that He had to say. And then He was crucified. And He was obedient unto death. Because He obeyed God rather than men. Because the truth could not be contained. Even the stones of the ground would cry out if Christ were not crucified. Christ must be confessed. Christ must be believed. And Christ must be the first and the best things in our lives. We must Remind ourselves daily that Christ is for us and is not against us. Even to the point where we see Peter and Judas, both betrayers of Christ, the only difference is repentance and faith.
Likewise, we see here poor Thomas, who is forever stuck with the name Doubting Thomas. Christ comes and he, for the first time to the disciples. And what's the first thing that he says? Peace be with you. And the irony is not that Christ is saying, we sure hope that the peace is with you. He, what he's saying is that peace is with you. Me, Christ, the Son of the living God, is the peace that is with you. And again, he comes and he says, peace be with you. And we see here the first ordination. When Jesus had said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you withhold the sins from anyone, it is withheld. These, of course, are the office of the keys that pastors hold to forgive sins and to bind sins. So we see there the first ordination. But we also see Thomas, who obeyed man rather than God until he actually saw God. Christ once again came amongst them and says, Peace be with you. Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not believe, but believe. Now, Thomas, I don't know how much we can get down on. Because who would believe in a, in a resurrection? Who would believe in a resurrection that would give us all hope? So Thomas saying, I'm not going to buy I'm not going to believe it until I see it. And so Christ obliges him. That's the strange thing. Christ obliges him. And he puts his fingers in his hands. And he puts his fingers in his side. Isn't it, how, isn't it wonderfully ironic how uh, he created the holy ministry by breathing on them and, and giving them the power to uh, forgive sins and loosen sins and then from the side is where the church comes from and Thomas touches and then he makes the most pure and perfect confession of faith that I've ever seen my Lord and my God my Lord and my God And Jesus says to him, You have believed because you, because you have seen me. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other miracles or signs in the presence of the, of the disciples, etc. But I say this, Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. Truly we are blessed by not having seen Him because the truth is we do see Him. And I don't mean in some mystical weird way. Like sure, sure we see Him. We see Him, every, we see him in the trees and in the, in the bushes and in the, uh, the butterflies and even in our children. Anything cute, God's in that. If it's ugly, no. Not so much. But rather, we behold Him and we see Him and we believe. In the Holy Supper of Christ, in the Eucharist, we find that we have seen Christ. 
We touch his wounds when we eat of his body and drink of his blood. And all of a sudden, our, our faith is strengthened. What a wonderful Easter, Lent and Easter time we had and obviously are still having. Baptisms. Members coming into the church. How wonderful all of that is. Yet, they have seen the body of Christ. They have eaten and drank of His blood. This is the wonderful thing about Easter. Christ is risen, and when He is risen, He says to you, Peace be with you, for I obey God rather than man. And because He obeyed God rather than man, that is your peace. That is your peace. Because he was faithful unto death, even the death on a cross. Thanks be to God. For we have seen and will see again Christ in body and in blood. See the wounds of Christ under that veil and make your confession. My Lord and my God.